I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. I'm so glad to have you here as I take you around San Diego for a quick recap of our most recent top stories. To start, most California families can expect to see some relief when it comes to the skyrocketing costs of fuel, food and housing. Governor Newsom just signed a budget deal that includes a $17 billion inflation relief package. This means some families could see more than $1,000. CBS 8's Richard Allen has more on who qualifies and when that money will come in. Well, that's right. Even though the state's gas tax will be going up later this week, these inflation relief payments will be going out to most California taxpayers, whether or not they own a vehicle. I think it's a great start. For most San Diegans, the idea of a direct payment from the state to help offset the skyrocketing prices of everything from fuel to food would provide much needed relief. We have to do something about it. And while some say this proposed rebate won't make a dent in their budget. I pay way too much already. 350 bucks is nothing. USD economics professor Alan Jin is applauding the move. I like the idea of giving consumers the money directly. He also says it's encouraging these rebates are not limited to just Californians who drive, which Governor Gavin Newsom had been pushing for earlier this year. Because we've had problems with, with inflation, with, with food prices going up, with, with housing costs going up, and so uh, everybody in the state then can, uh, can use some aid. Under the proposal, an individual taxpayer earning up to $75,000 would receive a $350 refund, which would double to $700 for joint filers earning up to $150,000. Claiming any dependents would mean an additional $350 for a maximum refund of $1,050. At the next level, single filers earning up to $125,000 would get $250 in refund, double to $500 for joint filers making up to $250,000. Any dependents would add $250 for a maximum of $750. In the third tier, individuals making up to $250,000 would receive $200, doubling to $400 for joint filers making up to $500,000. Claiming any dependents would mean an extra $200 for a total of $600. It would help a lot. But this help would not be immediate. Lawmakers say Californians could receive their rebates as early as October. And while it would come in the form of either direct deposit or a debit card, Jin is hoping for the latter. If it's given out in the form of a, of a card, then, then people would go out and spend that money, and that would help in the, the economy. And as part of this budget deal, California's diesel tax will be reduced by about 23 cents a gallon starting in October, a tax holiday that will last for 12 months. And Richard, no doubt the housing market is red hot and the rental market is heating up right alongside it. Median rent prices in the U.S. have jumped 14% in the last year. Nationally, rents went up 1.3% last month. But here in San Diego, they jumped 2.3% in June. Compared to this time last year, local rental prices are up nearly 20%. Since the start of the pandemic in March of 2020, San Diego rental prices have gone up nearly 28%. The median cost of a one bedroom in San Diego is nearly $2,000 and about $2,500 for a two bedroom. Now this comes as tens of thousands of California families who are unable to pay their rent due to COVID-19 hardships could soon be facing eviction. As of July 1st, the legal protections these renters had, essentially shielding them from eviction proceedings, will officially expire. But again, as CBS 8's Richard Allen discovered, thousands of these Californians are still waiting on millions of dollars in rental relief promised by the state. Well, that's right. Those protections put in place for renters impacted by the pandemic are set to expire Friday morning, even though more than 80,000 households who have applied for emergency rental assistance statewide are still waiting for an answer on their applications. I just feel that the state has failed us. You know, they have failed us. Well, Imperial Beach resident Patricia Mendoza still waits for $9,000 in rental assistance from the state. The mother of two has already received an eviction lawsuit from her landlord. Honestly, my anxiety is going through the roof. Anxiety she feels not only for herself, but for other renters in similar situations, also facing homelessness as they await assistance promised by the state. And I pray and I pray to God that that they'll do something for this program, that they'll do something for our people, because this was supposed to help people, not 
have people like this. According to the nonprofit group Policy Link, there are currently more than 85,000 renter households who applied for COVID rental assistance from the state still waiting for an answer. It's highly unlikely that they are going to get through all these applications by June 30th when the eviction protections expire. So that means that people will still be waiting in line and they will be exposed to eviction. CBS 8 reached out to the state to see if the current eviction moratorium to protect applicants for COVID rent relief could be extended beyond July 1st. It has not yet received a response, but several nonprofits dedicated to protecting California renters, including ACE, are not keeping quiet. They filed a lawsuit against the state to challenge the more than 150,000 denials for rent relief, which is about one out of every three applicants and to challenge the practice of tenants not being told the actual reason that they were denied so that they can appeal. We are seeing tenants denied rental assistance for reasons that we cannot figure out. Mendoza, now working as a statewide organizer for ACE, says she's dedicated to getting renters the help they need. I want to make sure that that this program does what it was supposed to do and it's help people stay in their homes. And for some resources for renters who are still waiting for assistance from the state, just go to CBS8.com and click on the help button. Richard, thanks again. Now, if you live in the city of San Diego and won't be able to pay your July rent, you have until the 7th to officially notify your landlord. In February of last year, the city passed an eviction moratorium stopping landlords from evicting some people for not paying rent. However, the state's COVID-19 tenant protection stopped San Diego's from taking effect. With those now expiring, the cities can take effect. Your landlord can ask for proof showing you've lost your job or your income took a hit. However, there are some caveats. It doesn't prevent the landlord from filing an eviction, right? Let's say you, you do everything you're supposed to and the landlord still ignores it and follows the eviction. Um, it doesn't prevent the landlord from filing the eviction. What it does is it provides you a defense to so that you would win in an eviction case. You'll also still owe the money that you didn't pay. The non-payment eviction moratorium is in effect until 60 days after the mayor lifts San Diego's local state of emergency. The no-fault eviction ban that is also in effect works under the same timeline or until September 30th, whichever comes first. Well, tens of millions of dollars of your money is going toward overtime pay for the sheriff's department, and some are asking if the overtime is really needed. The San Diego County Sheriff's Department has implemented mandatory overtime to address their staffing shortages. CBSA dug into the numbers and found that the county has paid $113 million in overtime since 2019. All of that spending has some taxpayers asking how that money is being spent and is it necessary? CBS 8's Regina Urita has been working for you to get those answers. If you see a San Diego County Sheriff's Department recruitment ad like this one circling social media or on your TV. At the San Diego Sheriff's Department, we are the first to help. It's probably because the department is in need of candidates to fill hundreds of vacant positions. Plagued by staffing shortages, the Sheriff's Department is trying to keep workers from quitting while also replacing those who left. The news of rising job vacancies has now prompted a spike in overtime pay. That is not going towards programming. That is not going towards increasing the number of doctor's visits for inmates that we are seeing dying at historic levels in the county jail system. It's not going to additional training for deputy sheriffs when we see study after study about racial profiling. Which is why the department and taxpayers are not happy about it. As of right now, 288 positions still need to be filled. Half of those positions are for jobs inside our local jails or courthouses, and 130 are newly created positions that do not impact day-to-day -day operation. Tonight, I spoke with Dave Myers, who spent more than 30 years with the San Diego County Sheriff's Department and ran for sheriff in the June primary. I asked about the justification for the overtime spending and if this is the best use of taxpayer dollars. We should be better stewards of the taxpayer dollars. Meyer says mandatory overtime only makes matters worse and blames the lack of management oversight. What I've seen recently is historic low morale within the sheriff's department. Then what you see is great swings in fluctuation of overtime usage, which is monies. 
that cannot be spent elsewhere on proactive crime prevention policing. This comes just four months after an audit revealed that 185 people had died inside county jails in a 14-year span. With so many questions still on the table, I reached out to the Sheriff's Department tonight. In a written statement, they say the staffing shortages and forced overtime in county lockups have not contributed to the high death rates inside jails. In response to the high number of overtime payouts, they say it should drop due to fewer critical incidents like fires. Regina Urita there reporting. Well, meantime, Oceanside police are helping people get relief from these unprecedented gas prices. Police officers are hitting the pumps and handing out $50 bills for gas to unsuspecting drivers. How about that? This first started as a secret Santa operation back in December, but it's now grown to a year long project aimed at spreading random acts of kindness around the city of Oceanside. Officers picked out people who look like they could use a helping hand or a kind gesture. We do things throughout the year. Um, right now, with uh, the gas prices we are, uh, we thought it would be a good idea maybe just go help people out at the gas pumps. Yeah, each month a different giving effort will focus on making connections between Oceanside officers and the community. Well, now that we're in the month of July, new state laws take effect. From gun control to school start times, there are more than 700 bills signed by Governor Newsom that are now law. CBS 8's Rocio de la Fee breaks down the most notable and how they could impact you. July 1st marks the beginning of a new fiscal year, meaning new laws will go into effect in California. Along with those laws, controversial gas tax increase set to cost drivers an additional three cents per gallon at the pump. It's outrageous, man. It's ridiculous. They've gone up a lot in the past few weeks. The annual increase is due to a bill signed into law back in 2017 that gradually increases the fuel tax each year. Governor Gavin Newsom proposed pausing the gas tax increase earlier this year due to the rising inflation cost, but his request was struck down by lawmakers. The tax money will go toward highway and road improvement projects. Also on Friday, new gun control measures are set to move forward. The new red flag laws will make it possible for concerned family members, teachers, co-workers and employers to ask a judge to seize what's known as ghost guns from someone they believe could be a danger to themselves or others. Ghost guns are guns bought in parts and assembled at home, making it harder for law enforcement to track. Also effective Friday, middle and high school students will get to sleep in a little later. A new law is pushing back school start times. It requires middle schools to start no earlier than 8 a.m. and high schools to start no earlier than 8.30 a.m. The law does exempt rural school districts. Starting this July, a new law will require bartenders in the state and their managers to pay for training. The new law makes training mandatory in an effort to help put a stop to drunk driving. Bartenders hired before July 1st have until August 31st to complete training. Those hired after July 1st have 60 days from their start date to complete the required training. Rocio, thank you. Well, now to the remain in Mexico policy. Thousands of migrants have been camped out just over the border in Tijuana. Many have gone through tough conditions for several months now. We spoke with some of them who tell Richard Allen that they are hopeful the recent decision will soon end the long wait at the border. Well, that's right. Since this policy was first put in place in 2019, thousands of migrants fleeing danger in their home countries have been forced to stay in equally dangerous encampments in Tijuana. Emily Vasquez has been staying in a shelter in Tijuana since last August, forced to remain in Mexico after fleeing her native country of Guatemala, fearing for her and her family's lives after receiving repeated threats and harassment back home. She says since coming here, her family used their savings to pay for an immigration attorney in Mexico who turned out to be a fraud, taking their money without helping them. She's now hopeful the end of the remain in Mexico policy will make it easier, allowing her to reunite with her father and siblings who are already here in the U.S. Estela Chu, also from Guatemala, has the same sense of optimism. 
happy about the justice's decision as she shares her harrowing experiences in her home country, where as a small business owner, she says she was continually threatened and extorted for money by local authorities. This woman, who goes by Maria, fled her home in Honduras more than a year and a half ago. She says she's terrified she'll be sent back there before her immigration case is heard in the U.S. She says her and her daughter's lives were constantly threatened in her hometown, but also says that Mexico is equally unsafe, especially for young women. She's encouraged by the court's decision, but also concerned that Title 42, a pandemic-era public health order that allows the U.S. government to block migrants seeking asylum from crossing into the U.S., will remain in effect. And as for the Remain in Mexico policy, the Department of Homeland Security says it will continue working to end the program as soon as legally possible. Richard, thanks. Well, as I continue to take you around San Diego, we have more now on a massive Russian super yacht that is floating in the San Diego Bay. The U.S. Department of Justice sees the Amadea near Fiji in May as a way to impose sanctions stemming from Russia's war in Ukraine. Federal officials sailed a $300 million yacht into the bay this morning. As you can see from Chopper 8 flying above, the boat is big. It's four stories tall, nearly 350 feet long, with its own pool and helipad. Its docking in San Diego comes after a more than 5,000-mile journey from Fiji. The yacht belongs to Suleiman Karimov. The U.S. Treasury Department say Karimov is part of a group of oligarchs who profit from Russian government through corruption and its activities around the globe. Experts say while this is one man's single boat, it's seizures like these that amount to a bigger impact from sanctions. Well, I think what, what the approach here is the cumulative one. Uh, no one individual act of seizure or one individual, any individual sanction is going to do the trick. But I think the cumulative impact over time is, is designed to uh, create enough pressure on Putin to, 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 to the point where we hope we can achieve the goal of um, reversing what he's done. In March, the U.S. created the Task Force Klepto Capture, a team of federal agents in charge of seizing assets belonging to Russian oligarchs in hopes of pressuring Putin to end the war. U.S. officials appealed to Fijian courts to seize the Amadea. The courts allowed Karimov to mount a defense, saying the boat belonged to another oligarch. Eventually, the Fijian courts allowed the U.S. to seize it. Jesse Pagan there reporting. Well, now to some crime news. Two years ago, two young boys, their grandma and step-grandfather, were out on a family walk. That's when 30-year-old Ashley Williams got high and decided to drive. Here's more from an emotional day in court. They were my everything. They were my life. The mom, who lost her two boys, mother and stepfather, in one single night, had the strength to speak in court. Just to think that I will never, ever be able to tuck my kids to sleep. That I will never, ever have a conversation with my mom. Right in the heart of COVID, May 5th, 2020, the family was out for their nightly walk on San Pasqual Valley Road when Ashley Williams inhaled a computer duster spray while driving, drifted 21 feet in the roadway onto a sidewalk and plowed into the family. 10-year-old Giovanni Felix, 11-year-old Emmanuel Riva, 50-year-old Carmela Camacho, and 33-year-old Abel Valdez. I think one day I may forgive her. Williams also had meth and marijuana in her system and was on probation following another DUI conviction just four months prior. Per a plea agreement, Williams confessed to three counts of second-degree murder and one count of gross vehicular manslaughter. A trial could have put her behind bars for 60 years. Instead, she'll serve 25. <laughs> One teacher also felt compelled to speak. She taught both the defendant and, more recently, one of the victims, Manny. But as a teacher, I never thought I'd be in a courtroom where a former student murdered a current student. Yeah, the judge called Williams selfish, said parents should never have to bury their children and hopes healing can now occur. As for Williams, she chose not to make a statement. 
And a lot of touching tributes are continuing to pour in for a beloved San Diego canine. Chopper the biker dog died in his sleep this week. He was 12 years old and battling cancer. A motorcade with about 30 cars and motorcycles made a final ride in Chopper's honor. They escorted him and his owner to a pet cemetery in Sorrento Valley. Chopper was well known around town and often went to military gatherings, holiday events and visited sick patients in the hospital. Well, there's been talk for years about ways to prevent suicide from the Coronado Bay Bridge, and now Caltrans says it's going to install a vertical net from the sides of the bridge. According to the resident group Coronado San Diego Bridge Collaborative for Suicide Prevention, the effort is a 10 year project. We're now about four years in, so Caltrans aims to have the net in place within the next six years. The next step is raising money for those nets. We're so impressed with Caltrans's progress that they've made and the sense of urgency that they have worked on this project with. Yeah, the net is estimated to cost about $130 million. Well, South County beaches now have new signage. The goal is to let you know just how safe the water is at any given time. Sewage has been a problem at some of our beaches for decades. So there are now three levels in this new pollution monitoring system instead of just two. The first tier warns bacteria levels exceed health standards. The next warns the water may cause illness. And the third says keep out. The county says residents have been asking for this for years, all to better protect public health. We spoke with one surfer in IB who wishes more could be done to fix the problem. We have our military here training in this. We can't expect them to jump in when the signs are up. The Navy SEAL base, the largest, the Pentagon of the West is right here. Fix the problem. All 70 miles of shoreline are tested regularly. One of our local supervisors, Tara Lawson Reamer, says she remains committed to repairing the aging sewage infrastructure so that we can, quote, permanently stop the flow and protect our beaches. Staying on health, San Ysidro is raising awareness of the services it provides to at-risk communities. City leaders partnered with San Ysidro Health to recognize National HIV Testing Day. They introduced a new mobile test unit that will increase access to care. HIV testing and prep enrollment is free. Right now, the mobile clinic only operates throughout the South Bay and Southeast regions of San Diego. However, services are expected to expand to East County. Meantime, the San Diego County Board of Supervisors is declaring fentanyl a public health crisis. Last year, more than 800 people in the county died from fentanyl overdoses. It's also the number one cause of death for people ages 18 to 45. By declaring a public health crisis, the board directed top health officials to develop a strategy to address the problem. The plan is expected to focus on several areas, including educating people who use and reducing supply. The board will readdress the crisis again in August. Well, just in time for summer, the Boys and Girls Club of San Marcos is celebrating their grand opening of a new facility. Here's Dana Marie McNichol with a look. I just took a tour of this beautiful new facility and let me tell you there were so many kids inside with the biggest smiles on their face experiencing new things while having a lot of fun. The ribbon cutting and grand opening for the new Walter J and Betty C Zabel Foundation Boys and Girls Club is a day to celebrate because it means 125 kids a day from San Marcos will experience this beautiful new facility. It has already started serving first graders through fifth graders this summer. Take a look inside. Kiddos receive state of the art technology, including high speed internet on the latest Chromebooks for homework. They receive art and cooking programs and fun is always top of mind here, especially with an eight person foosball table. I saw young kids reading and painting who tell me they love all these different activities that keep their mind active, especially during these summer months. CEO Kathy Bauer shared the kids reaction when they first saw the new Boys and Girls Club. One of the kids remarked, oh my gosh, this is like we're at Disneyland. And then another said, I think I'm a, in a dream. This is a dream come true. The kids love this space and you can hear it. You can see it on their faces, the laughter, the fun, the memories that are going to be made. 
Now, if you're a parent at home wanting to get your child involved in this, summer activities here are already at full capacity, but come fall, you can sign up for the after school program from 3 to 6 p.m. For any further information, head to CBS8.com. I'm Dana Marie McNichol coming to you from San Marcos. Dana Marie, thank you. Well, this one got a lot of us talking this week. Remember those mysterious lights spotted off the coast of San Diego? Well, the mystery has been solved. In a statement to CBS 8, the Coast Guard says those lights were not UFOs, but flares dropped from a Navy C-130 plane. It was all part of a planned training exercise near San Clemente Island. They say the lights may have lingered so long in the sky because they were attached to parachutes. Well, the best bakery in the country is right here in San Diego. That's according to a new ranking from Yelp. Isola Bakery in East Village has only been in business for two years. Owners Jeffrey Brown and Jenny Chen came up with the idea during the pandemic. Isola's website says they had no prior professional cooking experience, but had a dream to share fresh handcrafted croissants and loaves of bread with the masses. Well, the fair ended this week, but the guest services department is in overdrive, trying to return hundreds of lost items to their rightful owners. As we take you inside the Zevely Zone now, Jeff shows us everything from car keys to cold cash that was lost and found. When you lose something at the San Diego County Fair, thanks to these angels behind me, all is not lost. You know, I got keys, lots and lots of keys, and glasses, lots and lots of glasses. If you lost something at the fair. I have lots of wallets, purses, jewelry. There's a good chance Gail Tompkins has your stuff. This is what we get every year, and you wonder how in the world does somebody get home when we have all their keys. <laughs> you know, how do they do that? Midway. Gail keeps a detailed log of everything turned in. 65 people have said they've lost their cell phones. This is Those are like all a iPhone. brand new iPhone. Yeah. I know. After 21 it's years. A, it's a saber. You know, one of those lightsabers. Gail's yeah, seen it either. all. Uh, we had a brain scan one year. You know, it's like, oh, why does somebody bring their brain scan to the fair? <laughs> From sentimental to just strange. You come to the fair and you drive the wheels off your stroller. Off your you have stroller. so much fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I feel sorry for the baby that was in that stroller. We all know that horrible feeling you get when you lose your wallet. A young man came in and he was visibly shaken. I mean, visibly, he, the tears. Sue and Barbara returned that boy's wallet filled with his graduation money. He was so happy. He started crying and he made me cry too. <laughs> and I was so happy to give it to him. <laughs> Somebody needs that hat back. A lot of baseball caps. So yeah. many hats are lost when they fly off the heads of fairgoers. Lots of Padre hats. One visitor called in tears about a very special visor. Her father gave it to her right before he died. Terry Francie walked the fun zone until she found it. We're even helping Dodger fans? Yes, we are. Wow. In Padre country. <laughs> In Padre country. Yeah. We gotta get that on camera. And we couldn't have planned what happened oh. next. Oh. The fair's marketing director, Jennifer Hellman, who helped us set up this story. She just found her own keys. <laughs> what? <laughs> In the Zevely Zone. You're amazing. You found my keys for me. <laughs> Let's hear it for guest services. All right. Yay. Jeff Zevely, CBS 8. What a great angle, Jeff. Thank you. If you think you lost something at the fair, you can call the guest services department for that number or visit the Zevely Zone page at CBS8.com. Well, from the skyscrapers of New York to America's finest city, the first ever Spider-Man exclusive exhibit will premiere at the Comic-Con Museum. CBS 8's Chris Groh is in Balboa Park with a sneak peek. We are behind the scenes. We are fully immersed in the Spider-Verse, and we really want to show you all of the fun that we've been having today. This exhibit, it opens up tomorrow, and for all you Spidey fans, all you Marvel fans, if you just love comic books, this is going to be heaven for you.
the spider verse is, is always growing you know i think that's what's beautiful about the comic books is you know every week we're putting out you know 15 to 20 comic books you know always coming with new ideas new stories and trying new things and finding new characters like miles morales like ghost spider that might relate to a whole new generation of fans the exhibit is appropriately titled spider-man beyond amazing now you don't have to bring out your web shooters or even wear a costume but you can see all of that on display the history of spider-man but also never before seen original comic art large-scale character photo stations yes you will see those life-size spider-mans happening uh several photo opportunities as well too and a lot of the movie as well as even video game stuff that has really expanded the spider-man legend and story and get this tickets are only 30 dollars for a general admission meaning you don't have to have one of those comic-con badges which cost so much money in order to get in only 18 dollars for kids and there are also group rates actually you are their group rate for six or more which gives you a 20 20 percent discount yeah so just go online uh, if you go to our website and click on our poster of Spider-Man will take you right to the ticketing site. And, and look, the, the prices and trying to get into Comic-Con, it might leave you feeling upside down, but believe me, this place will have you feeling right side up in the Spider-Verse. It really has been such a cool experience today here at the Comic-Con Museum. So again, they open up this exhibit to the public tomorrow. Try to get online for those tickets. You can go to CBS8.com to learn more. Reporting from the Comic-Con Museum, I'm Chris Grove for CBS8. Love it. Chris, thank you. Well, that's going to do it for this week's Around San Diego. I'm Jenny Day with CBS 8. So glad to have you with me.